Harry, now, now that you know that this information is suppressed, what did you do about it? Or did you respond to the yeah. uh, officials about it? Yes, I did in a, in a very strong way. And I was very nervous about it because you can be put in jail or a $10,000 fine. After I found out about the observer mission failure, because Bart had called me and told me that the observer mission was going to fail because the <coughs> guys that were working with the spacecraft at NASA did not send his orbital correction numbers in because they hadn't worked with BART in many years. But BART was told and called by one of the staff members who did know him okay. and asked him to give them something to uh, prevent the observer from being destroyed by coming in at too great an angle into the atmosphere. They needed a course correction. And it was bumped upstairs, uh, but they ignored BART. And nine days later, it, it. And Bart predicted that it would crash around that right. time. What are your emotions? Of, uh, can you well, express them? <clears throat> yeah, it's just really sad to, to, to see the lengths they go to. They put a story out, an official announcement from NASA, that the bladder, fuel bladders in the hydrazine had been penetrated by micrometeorites, and thus it blew itself up. So what would it mean if people were exposed to the truth? I mean, uh, how would it affect the world, would you say? <clears throat> the observer was destined to uh, take photographs to verify the findings of Viking. Right. And understand that every spacecraft that ever was programmed that went there, BART provided those original numbers. Now understand that this is all these years later, half a century, the young bucks that are in there that were working didn't know about this. So they'd say, I'm full of crap, you know. Right. Well, I'm 72, and Bart's not much older than myself, and I was there. I mean, I wasn't present there physically at JPL or any other NASA place. I never worked for him, which brings up another point. I filed <clears throat> an affidavit with the FBI in 1988 after Observer failed, and after I phoned the Soviet embassy because BART did not want the scientists in the Soviet Union to discredit his name because BART had been working openly after detente and every, or whatever your crap you want to call it in the politics that mess everything up all the time. <clears throat> BART was into that, but still under the radar. So he had this layer of adults he had to go through. Anyway. He was an adult, obviously, in 88, and as such, he asked me if I'd call the Soviet embassy and get in touch with this certain scientist there, and I won't mention his name now because he's probably still alive. And um, he hasn't asked me, given me permission, so I will not. Well, in my affidavit, can I read it? Yeah, please. Uh, and what do you mean by uh, you'll be threatened with jail? I mean, if, if it's untrue, what you're writing? What do you mean? I mean, you mentioned... Uh, I mentioned real names. I don't... No, mean, you mentioned the, uh, this FBI report that you um, supplied, and you said there's uh, a danger of, of some sort of penalty if, if what? I mean, well, no. If you make a false FBI report, just like you make a false police report, there are consequences. So you were concerned about that? Yes, and, because they are going to search out and seek out what you did, and this is what I did. I gave them a whole dossier. I see. Senator Kerry's office got one this thick on the Mars Project. Right. All right. You follow? And when he chaired the House Intelligence Committee, hmm. I met him in the Mask of Furniture Mart parking lot. <clears throat> okay. And um, interestingly enough, within the 10 days, when they had the program sightings in another program with Molnar and the FBI agent looking for aliens, they had, <laughs> I got to read this first. Okay. But uh, all I can say is after I filed this document, that TV series ran a story on the face on Mars. Can you believe it? So don't tell me, don't tell me that there is not a psyops that's been going on since this program and since 47, a psyops that's going on that extends through every media station, 
every newspaper in this country and the media, and you can prove it to yourself and the general public if you go to any of the rover sites. Go to any of the rover sites and you will see imagery, particularly if you have 128, if you have 64 bitmap, you'll fare better in high definition. <clears throat> and look at all those so-called rocks up there and you will see artifacts on the surface that are petrified or vitrified, meaning that they have been radiated at such temperatures as to burn the rocks or turn them molten. Now, I've worked with high fire clays and I've worked with porcelain. I was trained at the Maryland Institute where I got my BFA in um, Baltimore, Maryland. And I was trained at Cranbrook Academy and I had a double major in architecture and painting at Cranbrook Academy. Mm -hmm. The academy that was founded by the Gustafs of Sweden and, and Carl Millis and Eero Saarinen taught there and I was, it's an extraordinary place. Anyway, I learned a lot of my trade there in the fine arts and I have a master's degree from there. <clears throat> and um, where was I? So you know there's something on Mars and the uh, government is covering yeah, it Yeah, so anyway, when the observer failed and when and after I got the documents from Bart, of Bart's work through Reverend Andre Cezad, who was living in New Hampshire at the time, mm. um, and I had orthographically overlaid and raster overlaid those images fit perfectly on these mesas in the Viking images, and you're gonna see them here. Good. Now, I knew that was proof. Here I've written to five science advisors under four presidents. Here at that time, uh, I had written to NASA directly in the planetary division and asked for answers regarding these alignments in um, Alan Chambers, Briggs answered me and Joe Boyce answered me and said that it was all coincidental. I was also trying to get a grant to do a model of Mars mm. and found out that the USGS had some that looked like crap next to mine and they had an $18 million grant to build a piece of crap and I had not received nor had I asked from anybody. I've given everything pro bono just like Bart has since, since this got off the ground. So mm. here's the information. I provided information in support of the concerns. This is a slide <clears throat> of matters that regarded the unsolicited um, information I received in the US mail. My experiences with the Mars Project Omaha research and the recent failure of the NASA um, spacecraft. And it's highly probable, I stated, that led me to conclude a conspiracy may exist within the NASA community. And I wish I could find a better word than conspiracy because I think that's overused. And the minute you say that, the giggle factor engages the naivete of the public. And it's highly probable military personnel, the civilian NASA employees, have orchestrated failure of various space programs sabotage various spacecraft and suppressed information unlawfully from the public eye. Why unlawfully? Because when you make a scientific discovery and you're wearing three different hats, including the military, and they shut you up because you see a little bugger boo sculpted into the, uh, a 12 ton stone on the surface and you can't stand up and talk about it. And Vincent Gregg, after I went to they could not talk about their own discovery at NASA because they worked for Bendix and Bendix had a contract with NASA. And the military took you over get what NASA. I'm saying? Yeah. Every one of those poor scientists have to <clears throat> be subjected to that, but they need a job, don't we all? Yeah. Okay? And so I wrote in a disclaimer. I wrote I say these disclaimers is that I do not Harry A. Jordan, nor have I ever knowingly worked for NASA, any federal agency or contractor. I am a private researcher who worked with NASA data and personnel under an independent investigation whose purpose was to democratize findings from the 1976 Viking missions to Mars. I provided slides and drawings and constructed models strictly as support material for a return to to support material for return mission to Mars that I understood was being held in the Senate. I was informed this was a private investigative research group 
whose sole purpose was to analyze what appeared to be artificially constructed architectural structures on Mars, primary data base for this research were 66,000 binary black and white digital photos generated by Viking spacecraft which orbited Mars for two years. Understanding these Viking spacecraft were two modules, one for the surface and one to stay in orbit. So in 1987 to, 19, to August 1988, I produced 47 recognition drawings, four models, and slides and papers of same for this original Mars project housed at the University of California at Berkeley Peace and Conflict Center. That original Mars project investigation was headed by Dr. C. West Churchman, Nobel Laureate, and Professor Emeritus. Now he had awarded a grant to Mr. Richard C. Hoagland because Hoagland was a writer and former science advisor to Walter Cronkite during the early days of the Gemini and Apollo programs. Mr. Hoagland wrote and published a book entitled The Monuments of Mars First Edition in late 1988. It was published in brief credits. I say again, brief credits were given to my contribution and exchange with Mr. Hoagland for a period of two years. So this is to set the record straight, which is why I'm glad you let me do this. Yeah. Um, okay, brief credits were given to my contribution and exchange with Mr. Hoagland over a period of two years. By the full disclosure of what I've discovered and experienced is not generally known by the original principal investigators because in August of 1988, let me repeat that, in August of 1988, I was told to stop work with the data, but I did not. I completed this research totally at my own expense, time, and resources. Now, please read the Omaha World Herald article regarding the face on Mars, uh, because I wrote them an obituary that will give them one. C, I've never expected nor have ever been paid for this research work. I've not signed over any commercial rights made previous data statements or taken actions which would embarrass an FBI investigation. I am not employed by any intelligence agency for purpose of evasion or to gen generate disinformation. Now, the premise I submit for this investigative action is since failure of the Observer Mission spacecraft in late 1993, conclusive proof of intelligently constructed architectural artifacts on Mars will depend upon NASA's future success with manned and robotic missions to Mars. Any effort the FBI can pursue within this jurisdiction would A, ensure future NASA planetary missions, B, serve to eliminate concerns and or confirm these accusations. <clears throat> this data is offered to assist in finding the truth and to further the democratization of truthful NASA data. Nine days after I wrote this and sent it to the FBI in Washington home office, they had a program on television with Molnar regarding aliens. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff they had to research, somebody got murdered or something. And in their files, now I understand, I said somebody got murdered. And in their files were these documents. They pull out a document, and guess what it is? The face on Mars. Somebody was trying to send me a message. Hmm. So don't tell me that the intelligence organizations are not intertwined in our government with the media. I'm a veteran. Bart's a veteran. And I take it personally as well, professionally, and as a real patriot, not some damn act, some airhead tried to get through Congress without consulting the American people. And I've, everybody in my family has been in the military all the way back to the Revolutionary War. That's right. I'm a son of a Revolutionary War veteran and one of the American Legion. And my grandfather, Harry Dealer, worked on the models for the Department of the Navy and also was responsible for the efficiency of those Liberty ships being built during WW2. So, <clears throat> I am, as an educator, and as a former veteran, and an American, I am disgusted with, 
and appalled at the behavior of our politicians and scientists who continue to this day in their ivory towers with programs that are useless to humanity at large and only perpetuate a really, really bad system of accountability. When our young scientists and cream of the crop at Columbia I ran into at NASA in 1988, an engineering building three at Goddard, and if you're listening, I hope you listen careful, is that whatever department you're in and whatever hats you are wearing at the time, and you can't talk about a discovery that in your heart you so terribly want to share with your fellow worker, then you blame the Defense Department, you blame the military, and you blame our government and NASA for allowing too many hats to be worn by the same person. Because they did it to Bart Jordan as he grew up. Yeah. They still kept him under the radar and had him work in lowly stations while they sat there and gaffawed and smoked their goddamn cigars and got rich off of it, and he's still alive, and he's still kicking, and he's still talking. So the walls are going to come tumbling down, folks. The walls are going to come tumbling down because we got a real Jericho issue here, and the bugle is going to blow because I'm telling you, this isn't a whistleblower. I'm not a whistleblower. I'm an American citizen and a veteran, and I'm proud of the efforts I gave my country. I'm proud of the education I got. And when I take my education that I got from them, and I get it thrown back into my face, then God bless and protect the whole human race, because you sure aren't. It's people like myself and Bart Jordan that care about this country. Now here's another thing. In our age-old agrarian uh, banker attitude and our um, attitude of scientists in their lofty towers that look at a, at a young man like Bart and he looks so unopposing and, oh, you studied with Segovia? Oh, you didn't provide those numbers? That's impossible. Oppenheimer did that. Dr. Edward Teller has been pissed off since they wouldn't let him blow up the hydrogen bomb. I mean, think about that for a minute. I've had students in his class when he was, when he was still teaching out there. Right. And I'll name his name, Dan Batters. He won the science award also at NASA, hmm. was one of my students. Now, I would hope that Alexander Payne might be listening because I think Bart Jordan and you would get along well. I think Alex Payne, who was one of my students, um, who the first movie all about Schmidt and the politics in a high school, also in addition to that, would be the perfect person to tell Bart's Jordan story. Oh, and then Bart could tell about the dipole moment of water. And the dipole moment of water, absolutely. Absolutely. And that relates to the hydrogen uh, that mm -hmm. Teller was trying to get from him, but Bart was conscious enough not to uh, mm -hmm. share that. And right, and it's a good thing, too, yeah. because those fools probably would have, would have done it, well, just like they didn't listen to him, and here we have Billions of dollars wasted on the Observer program, and all those people pay for naught. And they exploded a hydrogen bomb in, in the upper atmosphere, <clears throat> which created an extra radiation yeah, belt radiation around the belt. Air. Yeah. Uh, so now, you know, all uh, it's interesting to note too, and I wondered about that because mm -hmm. I asked Jim Irwin about it, and also Wally Shira, and also Dr. Brian O'Leary. I met in person on that because he was an astronaut, mm -hmm. but he was never up. Uh, in some of those same situations. They all have a heart condition. Mm -hmm. They took the electrolytes out of the water. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? Taking the electrolytes out of the water. They were afraid they would get some kind of a, uh, an apparition that would cause the spacecraft to get on fire. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, guess what happened on the ground mm -hmm. later? The oxygen mixture inside of the, the spacecraft uh, is what did those astronauts in, and I think that was, that was just awful. So what gives you hope? With a, a messy and the uh, history, the, the record, uh, do you think there's any chance that now that you're coming forth and met Bart just this last let week? Me, let me do this one last thing, because that's why I came here, because it's been done. You can give the proof. Yeah, for the first time ever in, and I'm sure people are waiting for this, and First time ever to orthographically project and overlay these mesas. 
and to give the mathematical values and to give the origin of the Greek numbers and to give the, the, the proofs of what we said is that the symbol that's been used for Mars, which is the circle, the shield, and the arrow for the spear, um, is actually a map, but it's incorrect. The one that is real is on a statue in the Louvre in Paris, and I went to see it, my wife and I, during our 25th wedding anniversary. And um, I want to show you. Here is a paper. First, I'll show you the paper by Bart Jordan, and then I'll show you the analysis behind it. I'll show you the overlays that I did. But I want to make it very clear to people, and people should know, that my work and Bart's work predates the World Wide Web and predates NASA's use of digital imagery. Right. Bart's work and my work predates the World Wide Web and predates the use of digital imagery. Now, here is the paper that Bart wrote on time origin of the foot and decimeter, and to the right, you see these images. This is the DNA, the Jupiter pyramid, and I'll tell you why it's Jupiter in just a minute, and I'll show you. Okay. Here is frame 70 A13, 70th orbit, 13th frame. Here is the symbol as um, we use it on Earth. This value is 7, 9, 11. You multiply those together and multiply it by 35. Okay? This is the original symbol for Mars as everybody uses it in scientific notation. Make note of these angles. It is wrong. Out of there. The 2,000 year use of that is wrong. This is the pattern for the map that's on Gadaya of the Gesh in the Louvre, and you will notice the flanges here, and you will notice the cord that cuts across here. And this is the diameter of Earth in thousands of feet. Also, there are atomic numbers that relate to this in the sacred star halo. And the sacred elements, which I won't go into now, but later we're going to go into it in another series with your program. Good. Here is that symbol on the first recognition drawing I did. Here's your arrow. Here is your shield, orthographically corrected directly over the NASA print and Bart Jordan symbols line up in a straight line and I know what the degree is and where that's located. And here's one they got to explain to you. Why is it that those two lines are perfectly parallel, let me say it again, perfectly parallel with the edges of the frame in the Viking image? Why are they? Because they used Bart Jordan's numbers and programmed the spacecraft to really take only one picture that was important out of the 66,000. The only needle in the haystack that anybody knew about and came from BART was on that 70A13, proving that what he wrote about and discovered and gave to NASA was indeed on Mars, and here you see it. You see those maces and figures, which I'm going to show you a little bit later, and look at the angles, and this is your DNM pyramid here. Here's your face your precession triangle, and down here is your, uh, what I call a spiral volute, but is your harmonious necklace, which you're going to see here in a minute. Here, Albany, Nebraska, Mars Research, for the first time, we have the harmonious necklace over this tholus. 
and this is the precession tetrangle, right there for the very first time in Dover, New Hampshire, seven days ago, this was overlaid by the approval of BART and myself, which shows the ratios of this line. Now this doesn't tell the total story here, but look at it. There's no way in heck this is a coincidental trick of light, shade, and shadow. We didn't go up there and construct, but Bart sure as hell on earth drew these before 40 years, 40 years before Viking got off the ground. And here it lines up with the right eye of the face, which has the Pi Kiva overlap. Underneath that face are several other structures. By the way, folks, this is the Irazu, or Earth Mother, the frog. You can see the space here on this mesa, clearly. And this would be the frog's eyes. They had a very whimsical sense of of how to do things, and they worked for a long time. This thing is, this maze is two miles long, 2,000 feet high. And here, near it, is your precession tetrangle whose measurements are akin to the gestation period and the sidereal uh, time and the lunar references to Earth, Mother, Mars, and Venus. And here's your Venus figure. Look at these shots. This is half a million years ago. They made these things. And look how, I want you to see this. Here you see the indentation. And the shadows, I didn't put that mesa there. This drawing is Bart Jordan's drawing. And look at how perfectly that fits. Even the shadows suggest. And by the way, in his paper, Time Origin of the Foot and Decimeter, Origins of the Greek Alphabet, which we're going to go into, folks, in the next series, being done and clarified by Bart Jordan himself, this G uh, shows the harmonia and the sacred star halo overlaps that, and also the Jupiter pyramid. Why do we call it Jupiter? Because of this. I'm going to show you right now. There is Jupiter, the planet Jupiter, right there. Mm. Can everybody see that? Which you can actually see Jupiter's bands. And this is 15 seconds before and 15 seconds after your trinity, your alignment there. <laughs> Here is my alignment before I ran into BART and I was doing the drawing. I noticed that there was a parallax between the tholus and the mesa itself, which are definitely surveyed lines, lines of survey. But let's take a look at the overall master survey. There is the master survey, which shows Bart's thesis, as well as all the survey lines that I had placed in there for this review here. And it shows your tholus on these triadic spheres. These are 3.6 kilometers apart. Here's your face. Here are the hexagonal shaped mesas and it's 3.6 kilometers between six sets and pairs of two. Look at that going across the mesa. Up here to the north is a, guess what? A mastaba that has two circular retents and a fracture in its western apothem is akin to the slaughter racks that they used in ancient Egypt. It sounds morbid, but in order for them to gas out, they had these holes in the top. Here you can see this is kind of a rhombic shape. Here's another hexagonal shape, another tri triform. Um, and down here to the right, we have, oh my goodness, here's the Venus Mesa, and here's we have all of these shapes that Bart had predicted are there, okay? And up here in the upper right is a bonus point. 
for signature site 10, which is through the Greek ciphers, indicates a gnomon and a tholus. And here we have a crater that's 35 megatons, and you've got this artifact seven miles long sitting on the top of the impact crater. Would have been obliterated if it had predated it, but here it sits. Another pentagonal form. The entire, not just the primary, not the primary shapes that Bart had predicted, but in addition to these shapes. Now, I'm going to have him present. This was called the fort by Richard Hoagland. And this is actually, actually Alpha Mu Omega symbol, which Bart, including this right in here, is Greek, okay? Was intended to be, that thing is two and a half miles long. Think of the energy and the trouble they went to to do that and how long it would have taken. It, the whole area is literally littered with, with this kind of stuff. But the most important message is in the Cydonia plane itself here regarding those shapes. And there is a triform platform up here on the right of this crater. If you take Stonehenge and you take all 54 dolmens and menhirs and you array them inside of the crater. The north vector lines up perfectly with that gnomon. I'm going to show you in a second. And you have a 45 degree angle niche in a little penny pyramid on the edge of this puppy dog. Here is where the gnomon would set and then here is your stone hedge. Let me, let me do this again. I'll back that up. And you can see, now you can see them standing out a little better here in Stonehenge. In other words, if it is indeed a planetary sundial that is marking Mars, where is the place you can look on Earth to see the same thing? And there it is, right there. That sundial lines up with the gnomon that's on planet Earth here. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't go to Mars and put that there, but on Mars exists that crater and that gnomon was the signature site 10 that is actually mentioned in the Book of Enoch, believe it or not, which was left out of the Bible. The Book of Enoch translation that came from the Dead Sea Scrolls now get this, you religious philosophers and fanatics. Look this one up. Yeah, we know that the Book of Enoch is used by the Masons. But in the Book of Enoch is a treaty on Signature Site 10 on Mars. And guess who it was translated by? J.J. Hertog, who worked for NASA for 35 years, and he's a rabbi. Now, what's a rabbi doing working for NASA? Well, I'll tell you, because the translation, the Book of Enoch, is a scientific document. All right? Mm -hmm. And right here on Mars, <laughs> you have an alignment which cannot be disputed regarding the ancient megalithic structure that is in England, okay, has its northern obelisk and its alignment coincide with the, not only the crater feature, but this gnomon points to north on Mars also. Two structures, two construct, two constructs, on, on, and this is what that gnomon looks like, would have looked like. I, this is one of my drawings. What this gnomon would have looked like in front of the crater, seen at 1,500 feet and nine miles away. The crater is 18, the uh, horizon line on Earth is 18.2 miles. On Mars, it's nine something. So this would be from four and a half miles away. And it has a furrow down the center. And here is that alignment. 
unmistakable on Mars. Now I think that's just absolute, and the, the plane is, is, is littered with these constructs. And here is the, down here is going to be when Bart explains the time trinity and the symbol, this is a symbol for an atomic explosion. Let's cut to the chase. That is the symbol for an atomic explosion. This is a warning. The moons of Phobos and Demos demonstrate a warning to Earth not to do this again. Blow up a planet, will you? There's the model that I spent two years on, directly over a NASA print. I would not have been a, this is what they did with the image there at the Mayland Space Science Data Center, see his logo down here, which they called the fort. This is what it really looks like with the Alpha Mu Omega symbol. And here's Bart's drawing. This is the drawing that Bart did before Trinity, before the atomic bomb. It came to him, and look how close those... Here is the, the lambda symbol. It just... He is a treasure to humanity. There's Bart when he played with Segovia was a student of Segovia's. His old measures, new ideas from that paper that was sent to me. This is the paper sent to me by Reverend Andre Sazad. Here in the lower right-hand corner, you see the Jupiter Pyramid. It's atomic number now. And his other papers. This shows Bart's overlay. I did that for him. Because he can't see, remember, he's not, he doesn't know how to use computers, but he sure knows how to do his math. And here is Jupiter lining up over, lining up with Phobos, and Phobos is lined up over the DNM pyramid. I mean, the Jupiter pyramid on Mars right there. That's part of my model right there that I inserted there and just demonstrated that little thing there. So I wanted people to see it. You see how perfect. <laughs> That's it. Um, it is not at, it is at 40 degrees, 40.870, not 40.868, because that had set it several hundred feet off center. It's 40.870 by 9.1. And this is the overlay of the, and I will set my bow in the heavens to show my covenant with man. On Mars, the pyramid was covered in rainbow colors. Here's the layout of it. Here is the pyramid today. This was taken by the European Space Agency Express, Mars Express. It shows more highly eroded and definitive bases, but nonetheless, you can see the constructs here. And it does show that platform at the base of the pyramid. This is the information provided, what they called by Merton Davies, on the DNM pyramid. And of course, they call it the DNM because the D stands for DiPietro, shorthand, and Molinar when they, and M for Molinar when they first discovered it, and they went to the Colorado conference which, by the way, was another sham. They went to Richard C. Hoagland to have him promote their findings because NASA would not allow them to get up and speak on their own work. I was there. Hmm. All right? So what does Richard Hoagland do when he's out in Pasadena and JPL? <laughs> he takes their paper, which is essentially their book, and he takes and types one page on the top of it, and use their title, Unusual Martian Surface Features. 
and went up to the microphone, he wasn't on the itinerary and started speaking. And then people started to come in and sit down. And that's how Hoagland got his... That, that's the way he worked with the independent Mars investigation. When he told me to stop work on my model, I really got suspicious because I'm sure that I would have been really taken for a ride. Well, I was until I got wise, and I'm glad I didn't say my model out. God knows. I, all the work and heart I put in, and then the people just sort of... That's kind of the attitude, I think, everywhere now. <clears throat> is it's people just, because they're so instantly gratified by using a computer and sitting around in front of a CRT screen is extremely dangerous because in just a millisecond you can wipe out all of the sweat equity somebody has put in a project and has been taken advantage of since time memoriam that has happened. The way governments and the churches and scientists use people is just disgusting. It makes me want to vomit. And I, I'm sorry, I have nothing agnostic against the church, but let's put, it, let, let's put it where it really belongs. The reason churches gave the build, I mean, they gave humanity a way of giving them jobs and craftsmen. They were the reason for the creation of them and everyone. Uh, you know, they were put in the center of towns so they could be seen during the Middle Ages from afar, you know, the steeples. Mm -hmm. But you look at the minarets around a mosque, like in um, India, the um, uh, Taj Mahal is just as much of a work of beauty and math and everything that is this. I, I think of Bart Jordan when I see that. Mm. Because the dome itself is time trinity. The ratios in proportion, that onion shape, has a very profound mathematical relationship with the beginning of that blast. It is embedded mm. in our psyche because we know, we know that there, this is a pure print of that 70A13. The only way these lines could line up with the edge of the frame of the spacecraft is because the block program in it told it to take that picture to see if indeed it was true. And NASA went there, they found it, they knew it was true, and they never told the world about it. Not a word. This was not easy for me to keep this inside. It was impossible yeah. to think that Bart could have done it all these years, but here are two guys that we did do it. Yeah. For half a century, we kept it inside. Right. But we're here to tell the story now. And I knew there was a purpose to this, and the Lord gives us purpose, and it's a rare you give an opportunity. And Bart and I have really um, both have been emotional about it, but it is not, it's rare. And then for our names to be, you know, kind of related there, uh, but it's just been the most remarkable thing in my entire life to meet up with him because I think I was born to do this. I think I was, uh, I don't think chosen. I think that there could be, um, and there are many other people out there smarter than me that could do the same thing. I'm just helping the messenger to see. <clears throat> I'm his eyes uh, and um, I'm trying to understand his language and I think I do and it's not just Greek. Mm -hmm. It's Spanish, you name it. I mean, he's, he's an incredible linguist as well. Was on the only and first team sponsored by the government, and that's the reason they sent him down to Tehuacan. He's in a hiding, but still he's there, and, and he's been there since age five when they put him in Trinity School, and look how bright he was then. And he's, he's, he's aged and... He's slowing down now, and he has health problems, and they aren't helping him. They are ignoring his problems. They aren't listening to him because he's an old guy. He's going to fall off anyway, you know. Well, he believes he's um, also not being treated for an affection that he no, has. No, he's not own. being treated for an affection that he acquired uh, during his tenure with the government, mm -hmm. and Lord knows he's had enough of it. Whenever they choose to pull him out of a haversack and put him in the background, then they go back and... Uh, you know, do something else and sit around and gay fall and smoke their $100 cigars. Mm. 
And uh, I'm serious. I'm not just quipping here. I'm serious. He's, he's been taken and it's going to stop. Because right here, and he's going to share this, I'm not going to do it. I don't have the right to do it. So Bart's going to do it. These are the angles. The Greeks, you know, they don't have an angle of 90 degrees. But this one is. But I think it's because of the erosion. They have... 32 degrees down here, and it's 58 degrees here. We've taken a protractor on this. And look at this little guy down here. And this ribbon is 11, this one's 9, and this is 7, and the circle is 35. Let me say that again, folks. 11, 9, 7, and 35. Multiply those together and see what you get. I'm not going to tell you. But you do it, and when the number comes up, look at that number, stare at it, and think about what you're looking at. Hmm. That's something for your viewers that can do some homework. Good. Because yeah. we're going to do more of these, and I'm really looking forward to it. Each one of those mesas I have more details on. Hmm. Their dimensions and their location, their datum points, their latitude and longitude can be established and checked on Google Mars. The ESA has inter lace that with their imagery uh, and um, unfortunately there are people that are already goosing the site with claptrap and trash uh, and, and tourist agencies because anybody that has a URL site in an image can relate and I'm just waiting for little monsters to show up and all silly kind of stuff to put it in a realm of the giggle factor I call it. If you want to Screw somebody, s screw someone's serious science. Hmm. Okay? And here you're talking about two veterans combined research a hundred years within that time frame, coming together for the first time in Dover. And you want to sit there and put a giggle factor on it? If every engineer and scientist look to nature, in the natural state, they'll get the answer to their design problem. And I don't care in what area of science you're in. When the nuclear submarine was being designed, the engineers looked at the Nautilus seashell animal that goes down 2,000 leagues in the Ionian Sea. When you cut the seashell in half, it has a ballasted bladder inside in these chambers that go like this. Logarithmically, one large arc, one small arc, so forth, so forth, and so on. If you take that profile and you put it over any schematic of a nuclear submarine, it will fit perfectly any Nautilus shell, because that is what nature invented. Okay? Mm. And so they used the mathematical volumes inside of that Nautilus seashell and its schematic to design nuclear submarines so that they could dive deep and they would be able to sustain the pressures at that depth, just like the Nautilus seashell. Mm. By the way, the first submarine, Nautilus. Yeah. Wonder why. Well, I'm so glad you crossed the country and, and um, hung out with Bart and Thank you. went through the work. And uh, that alone says more than any of the words that we can tell you. But there is images up there and, and <clears throat> people are talking about it. So we're going to keep working at this and uh, not give I look up. forward to it. Yeah. And even though I'm going back to Nebraska, because mm. my wife and I are going out to Utah uh, to hang with the Mormons for a while. Mm. She loves the genealogy research, and I'm going to do some other things. But Bart has a laptop, and so do you, with all of this stuff that I brought. The entire Viking imagery, my book thesis, and the extraordinary, for the first time, for me to be able to converse with a man of his caliber has just been the most fulfilling thing in my entire life. It's uh, been my life. And uh, in a way, even while I was teaching or practicing architecture, and all of my students out there that would see this, uh, 
I would say wherever you are, whatever university, whatever, if you're in uniform and you want ever any input from me, just give me a call. And um, I won't give you my cell phone, but I will be making an announcement about my post office box in Albion, and I will answer. Mm. I don't care if I get a thousand because I have a lot of friends out there too. Mm. And I've probably taught over 30,000 students in, in 42 years. And um, that was at Creighton Prep School in Omaha, Nebraska, the longest time. And I taught at um, Oakland University in calligraphy and did some adult studies there. There's a lot of connection to science and art and spirituality. Oof. And um, <clears throat> as Bart says, our future's in the past with no escape present. And so um, maybe we've done this before, but maybe uh, because of our work, there'll be a different outcome this time and we won't destroy uh, this precious earth. And thank you for coming here and being well, with thank me. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I, it's been a pleasure. It's been well worth it. I just uh, looking forward to get back to Nebraska, but uh, yeah. I'll be coming out.